even with the risk of losing him for nothing this offseason, the Sacramento Kings trading Harrison Barnes would be a terrible idea. And we can look back to the only real season of promise in the last 16 years, the 2018 season, as a perfect example why. We'll discuss that, plus three things the Sacramento Kings need in order to have a successful six-game road trip. It's all right here on Locked on Kings. You are Locked on Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time. Time for another episode of Locked On Kings. Hello and welcome to Locked On Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all regular season and all off season too. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I'm a Sacramento sports reporter and producer for ABC 10 News. And the idea of trading Harrison Barnes is a conversation we've had many times on Locked On Kings over the last few years, especially around trade deadline time. The last two seasons before this one, around the trade deadline, Harrison Barnes' name was brought up a lot and it was or the the main bit of the conversation around trading Harrison Barnes is that t- at that time was Harrison Barnes's value was probably never going to be higher. Well, I think that's proven true. Harrison Barnes's value right now compared to what it was over the last couple of seasons around the trade deadline isn't as high or at least so we believe. And there are many that think that the Sacramento Kings, especially during those two seasons when they were struggling as mightily as they were, should have capitalized on his value then, tried to get some assets, whether it was uh, draft picks or a young wing, a young player or two, uh, to add to this current Kings core that is having so much success. And it's fair to look at this Kings team right now, look at Harrison Barnes. And even though we discussed on uh, the most recent episode of Locked on Kings after the Kings win over the Bulls, that Sacramento is nine and one when Harrison scores 13 or more points, you look at the starting lineup and Harrison is at best the fourth option. If you look at the roster as a whole, I would put Malik Monk over Harrison Barnes in terms of offensive importance. Uh, Keegan Murray, I think at some point this season, will overtake Harrison Barnes, uh, whether it's in the starting lineup as an offensive option or just in general on the roster as an offensive option. So Harrison is not as significant or as important offensively to the Kings roster now as he was in years past. I don't think that necessarily has contributed to the lower value. In fact, I think it's better for the Sacramento Kings for Harrison to have a less significant offensive role. And that's not meant to be disrespectful for Harrison. We've seen from time to time, he can score 20 uh, plus points. He can flirt with 30 points. He hasn't really done that this season necessarily, but we know Harrison is capable offensively of providing the Kings uh, with a nice spark and, and at times carrying the Kings through certain stretches of games. But if you're relying on Harrison to do that the same way kind of the Dallas Mavericks relied on Harrison to do that as a primary offensive option before he was traded to Sacramento, I don't think it's the optimal job for HB, the optimal position for HB. I I said coming into the season, if the Kings can find a way to make Harrison Barnes the fourth or fifth option offensively, they're in really, really good shape. Lo and behold, they've done that. And as of right now, they're playing extremely well, but there still is the fear. There still is the concern that you have this starter, this wing. And remember Harrison Barnes playing the wing, the wing position is a historically difficult position for the Sacramento Kings to fill. If you look back besides Harrison Barnes and Rudy Gay, and you have to go all the way back to like Ron Artest, that wing position has had a lot of players who have come and gone. I know the main joke is John Salmons, but they're, they're, that's a tough position for the Kings to fill notoriously because and historically because that wing position is so essential in the modern NBA. Now, people think that point guard is the most important position, that this is a guards league, this is a shooters league now, and I do agree with that to some extent. However, If you look at all of the good or the best teams in the NBA, their wing position is really, really strong. And I would argue that the best players in the NBA, other than like uh, Steph Curry, uh, is you look at the legends like a LeBron James, you look at Giannis Antetokounmpo, the wing, that 3-4 spot is essential to success. So I understand fans are afraid of losing your starting primary wing with the exception of Keegan Murray for nothing. 
when Sacramento historically struggles in free agency and they haven't had too many opportunities over their history here in, in, in the California capital to be a free agent destination or be a team entering free agency with a lot of momentum on their side or with a good record. And even when you look back to the uh, the, the the glory days of old, Vlade Divac was a free agency signing. Many consider him the best free agency signing of all time. Of course, he was phenomenal and impactful with that Kings team. But it's if Vlade Divac is your biggest name that you've been able to sign free agent wise, I'm sure he's a Hall of Famer. It, it, there, it's not as it doesn't move the needle as much. It's not as exciting as other markets who have landed splash after splash after splash after splash. The Kings, free agent wise, can't compete with that. So when you struggle to retain talent, and when you struggle to add talent in free agency, having talent leave for nothing is a really big concern. I understand that completely. You heard me talk a lot about during the Bogdan Bogdanovich situation when Monty McNair and the Kings let Bogey walk. I thought that was a terrible decision. In the end, it's it's worked out now. I thought it was bad to let a player of value, a starter of value, go for nothing. So if you're concerned about the Kings losing Harrison Barnes this summer, I think it's more than valid. But trading Harrison Barnes, especially right now, and context might change between now and the trade deadline, but trading Harrison Barnes, I think, would be a terrible decision for the Sacramento Kings. James Hamm of the Kings Beat, ESPN 1320, he put on a report a couple weeks ago. It was right before I went on vacation. Um, and he, he was talking about, or he got a report from the Sacramento Kings that they're not looking to trade Harrison Barnes right now. They're just focused on winning. I was happy to see that report. I think that's the way it should be. Now, I also wouldn't necessarily expect the Kings to come out in the midst of a, at that time, they were on a six-game win streak and go, yeah, Harrison Barnes is available. Like, uh, So that report didn't necessarily surprise me, even though it was good for me to hear. But I know a lot of Kings fans are still going, no, you need to, if, if Harrison Barnes has value, if he's there's a good chance that he leaves this summer for nothing, you got to get something for him. Shop him. Make Harrison Barnes available. Trade Harrison Barnes and try and get another wing that helps this Kings team win right now. And that's the key right there. You do not trade Harrison Barnes unless you are getting as close to a guaranteed improvement and a guaranteed upgrade as you can. Now, there's no such thing as a guarantee, right? There's no such thing as this trade will absolutely make the Sacramento Kings better no matter what. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. That doesn't exist. But the closest thing you can get to a guarantee is trading Harrison Barnes and bringing in a player with all-star capabilities, an all-star caliber player. I don't include in that category a young up-and-coming player who maybe is a year or two away from being an all-star. I don't include that because that's not a guarantee. The Sacramento Kings, with the way they're playing right now, if they're going to trade Harrison Barnes, they're going to do it around the trade deadline for an absolute upgrade that hopefully puts them over the hump. What is that trade? Does that trade even exist? Now, there might be context between now and the trade deadline where some player on some team that we don't think is available suddenly becomes available because that team is actively tanking, right? An example in my brain, I don't think this is accurate, but an example in my brain is like, OKC makes Shea Gilgis Alexander uh, available because they're absolutely trying to tank for Victor Wimbayama. Again, I don't think that's going to happen. I'm just using that as an example. Shea Gilgis Alexander, in my mind, would absolutely be an upgrade, but does OKC consider a package mainly consisting of Harrison Barnes and likely draft compensation, maybe Rashawn Holmes put in there? How much realistically can that get you? I am not trading Harrison Barnes for anything short of as close to a guaranteed upgrade as I can get. And the main reason why is something that we've talked a lot about going back to the 2018 season. There's a lesson to be learned from the 2018 season. This is something that I've discussed with many of you over the years here on Locked on Kings. Remember the Iman Shumpert trade. Remember how much that team was rolling. If I'm not mistaken, it wasn't the Iman Shumpert trade, but that was the year that the Kings acquired Harrison Barnes. They were off to a really, really good start in the 2018 season. They acquired Harrison Barnes at the trade deadline. They moved Iman Shumpert, I believe, to the Houston Rockets. And that team never looked good and missed the playoffs. What did we talk about for the rest of that season? Wow, this team has lost their mojo. Wow, this team has lost their vibe. The Sacramento scores were no more because Iman Shumpert was traded away. Now, Harrison Barnes is a significantly better player than Iman Shumpert is. In that specific situation, it was less the Kings losing talent. They didn't really get anything for Iman Shumpert, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. 
it was less the Kings losing talent. I think they upgraded talent wise, trading away what they did and getting Harrison Barnes plus a couple of other pieces. I think they improved, but the vibe of the Kings, how the Kings were playing, how they were gelling, the scores was broken apart. And we saw that had a immediate visible effect on the Kings locker room and the way the Kings were playing. So while Harrison Barnes is a better player than Iman Shumpert, you could argue, yeah, Iman Shumpert was far more of a locker room presence than Harrison Barnes is. So if the Kings were to trade away Harrison Barnes this season, Malik Monk is still here. We've talked about Malik Monk kind of being that passion, that lifeblood of the Kings that we haven't really seen since Iman Shumpert. Malik's still here, so the Kings will be fine. I disagree. Because I think Harrison Barnes, in fact, I don't think, I know Harrison Barnes is a far more significant presence in the Kings locker room, in the Kings practice facility, on the Kings bench, and in the game for the Kings, in the huddle for the Kings, than people realize. Harrison is not a scream and yell type leader. Harrison is a pretty quiet and reserved man. He's extremely respected and has a very high basketball IQ. Harrison is a leader in the Kings locker room. He doesn't have to be the leader. He doesn't have to be the guy. He doesn't have to be the guy taking center stage, although I'm sure he appreciates being sent to the podium a lot less this season than he was last season, seemingly, after every single bad Kings loss to speak and try and t handle the questions for why the Kings were playing so bad. Like Harrison is an, is an essential part of this Kings team. So if we can look back to the last time the Kings were off to a good start and see a mid-season trade completely rocked the vibe, the mojo of the Kings, and you look at how the Kings are playing right now, the beam team, the vibes that they have in practice, the smiles, how well they're playing together, and we're not afraid that trading Harrison Barnes away would do the exact same thing, I think, I mean, history has a tendency of repeating itself. I think we're completely ignoring that situation. Now, I'm not saying you don't move Harrison Barnes at all or you don't make any trades at all because you're afraid of, of, of that uh, killing that vibe or ending that mojo. My point is Monty McNair has to be absolutely sure if he's going to move Harrison Barnes, he has to be 100% sure that he is getting or as close to 100% sure as he can be uh, that is possible that he is getting an upgrade that he is getting someone who is going to improve the team immediately, not take the rest of the season to vibe, and then maybe maybe he reaches his potential with the Kings next season. Nah, if you're trading Harrison Barnes right now, you're getting a player that right now is going to make the impact that you want, a better impact than what Harrison Barnes gives you. And he, they also have to be a wing because, yeah, the Kings have a little more depth. You could get away with... Um, starting Keegan Murray at the four, moving Kevin Herter to the three. Maybe you move Malik Monk into the starting lineup at the two if you really, really have to. Like, you can get away with that. But I don't think you need another guard. You could use another big, but are you getting, like I'm saying, you're not trading Harrison Barnes away for a backup big who's going to take minutes away from a DeMontis Sabonis or take minutes away from Keegan Murray more than likely. So... It has to be a wing. It has to be someone who directly replaces Harrison Barnes at that starting three spot, who is better than Harrison Barnes, who again is an upgrade for the Kings. I don't know if that trade exists. Yes, I run the risk of losing Harrison Barnes for nothing if it means the Kings stay locked in, stay dialed, continue to play the way that they play. And I'll say this too. During the offseason, uh, one of my ideas was, hey, maybe the Kings are hoping that they can put together such a good season this year that Harrison Barnes wants to return. Because I, I felt pretty confident in saying that Harrison this summer was not too uh, opposed to the idea of moving on, right? Who wouldn't be? Like, Harrison is thinking about this is the last big contract that he's going to get. He probably wants to go and try and contend. The Sacramento Kings are playing so well right now, are building such a vibe. If this continues through the season, let's say the Kings make the playoffs and are knocked out in the opening round of the playoffs. But the Kings clearly have something there and feel like, okay, now we take this, we learn from this, we improve a little bit over the offseason, and next season we're winning that opening round and we're moving on to the, the conference semifinals, then keeping our eye on the conference final, whatever. Does Harrison want to stick around and be a part of that? I think that's far more likely today. That possibility is way more likely today and way more feasible today as it ever was when I was discussing it during the offseason. Trading Harrison Barnes to me is a bad idea. 
It's a bad idea. It's worth the risk of losing him this offseason. I don't think what you need is attainable right now. Again, context could change between now and the trade deadline. But I don't think, and I'm glad that that report went out there, from now until we get some of that context, from now until January, end of January, early February, I don't think we should even breach that subject, even discuss that. Because it's it's not... I don't think it should be in the realm of Monty McNair's thinking. He should always keep his eye and ear open on ways to improve the Sacramento Kings. But the idea of trading Harrison Barnes right now when this Kings team is playing so well to start the season, I think is foolish. But let me know how you feel. At Matt George Sack on Twitter. Email me, Matt George Sports at gmail.com. Leave your thoughts in the YouTube comment section down below. Today's episode of the Locked On Kings podcast is brought to you by Turo. Turo is the world's largest car sharing marketplace. It's like... Verbo or Airbnb, but for your vehicles. With Turbo, you can book any car you want whenever you want it from a community of local hosts. Browse a huge selection of vehicles for just about any occasion or budget across the US, UK, Canada, or Australia. Book a spacious SUV or minivan for a family road trip. That would have been helpful for me and my family driving to Los Angeles for Disneyland. Uh, you can get a classic or luxury car for a special event, birthday, holiday, prom, whatever it is. You can also find affordable economy cars if you're on a budget and just need to get from A to B. So you Sacramentans, you're trying to get to San Francisco for a business trip, get an economy car. Or if you're interested in maybe getting a Tesla or an electronic vehicle, but you're unsure about it, you can test drive that electric vehicle and keep your eye on it to see how it fits in your everyday life. Many Turo hosts can even deliver the car right to you. Every trip is backed by liability, insurance, terms and con conditions, and exclusions do apply. Forget boring rental cars. Find your drive at Turo.com. Even with the Sacramento Kings on a three-game win streak, and even if I'm looking at this upcoming six-game road trip and seeing games like the uh, Detroit Pistons game at the end or the New York Knicks game in the middle, there are definitely winnable games for the Sacramento Kings on this trip, of course, but a six-game road trip, an Eastern Conference road trip, is never easy for a West Coast team and historically has been a struggle for the Sacramento Kings in the past. So here are three things that I think the Sacramento Kings are going to need in order to have a successful road trip. And to me, bare minimum of successful road trip is 500, going three and three over this six game stretch. I think four and two should be the goal and is more than attainable based off how this Kings team is playing. Five and one would be phenomenal. Six and oh would be through the moon. I'm happy with three and three. My goal is four and two personally. These are the three things that I think will need to happen amongst many other things, but the three main things I think will need to happen if the Sacramento Kings are going to accomplish that. Number one, star De'Aaron Fox needs to make a reappearance. De'Aaron started the season red hot, right? He was playing ridiculously well. Now, unfortunately, while he was playing really, really well, the rest of the Kings team was trying to figure themselves out. Mike Brown was trying to figure out his rotations and the Kings weren't necessarily winning all those games. And I think the lazy argument or lazy comparison is, oh, see, when De'Aaron Fox was playing his best, the Kings were struggling. Like, I think that's, that's a slippery slope. My point is, at times, you are going to need your star to carry yourself through. We saw it on the road in the Kings win against the Orlando Magic when De'Aaron Fox absolutely took over uh, in the fourth quarters and in overtime. Didn't just hit that massive half-court shot, but before that shot, he was in takeover mode. I think De'Aaron Fox takeover mode, star De'Aaron Fox, a 30-point game at some point from Fox is going to be needed for the Sacramento Kings to get a win during this road trip. That's not to say that what the Kings have been getting out of De'Aaron Fox recently has been bad because... Even on games where offensively he's been struggling and we've discussed him playing a little banged up. He also mentioned that he's had a little bit of a bug or a, a, the, the illness going around. And I can certainly speak to how obnoxious that cold and cough was. I got it twice, for God's sakes, over the course of a month and a half. I know De'Aaron has reasons for not necessarily playing his best right now, but De'Aaron has also stepped up in major ways other than offensively, while going through this stretch. Defensively is the main one. I think De'Aaron has played some of the best defense of his career over the course of this stretch. And I think the Kings as a whole, I talked about this after the Bulls game, the Kings as a whole have leaned heavily on their defense in order to pull off this three-game win streak. Or if the offense is what we're praising the Kings for and focusing the King uh, on the Kings with during their seven-game win streak, I think this three-game win streak, a lot of attention goes to how well the Kings are playing defensively holding the, who was it? 
on the road, the Cleveland or the LA Clippers to uh, under 100 points, followed that up by holding the Chicago Bulls to just 101 points. Like that's really solid for the Kings. And De'Aaron Fox is a major part of that. The Kings are definitely going to need De'Aaron Fox to still be dialed in defensively. But I think De'Aaron returning to that all star offensive scoring, get on my back form is going to be required at some point during this road trip. Number two, Kevin Herter. Kevin Herter has not been horrible, but his offensive shot has completely disappeared over the last five games. So much though, I was I was looking at his uh, his game log and his game stats, and I was like shocked to realize how poorly he is shooting the basketball right now from three. Over the last five games, he is four for thirty one over the last five games from three point range. That's thirteen percent if you round up. Yikes! Now the good news is. He's also contributed. I mean, he's 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 hit two point baskets and he's contributed in other ways, rebounding, assisting. There's a reason why, and it's the perfect timing for Malik Monk to be playing the best basketball so far of his season, and I'd argue his career. While Kevin Herter is struggling this much, we knew Kevin was not going to be able to sustain shooting 52, 53, 54 percent from three point range like he was for the first ten games or so of the season. I did not expect this steep of a drop off. I think Kevin Herter's outside shot needs to make a reappearance and needs to get back to that 40% range, mid 40s ideally, if the Kings want to have success during this road trip. That's number 2. Finally number 3. This is something that's been consistent throughout both win streaks for the Sacramento Kings, and I think this is not going to be essential just for this road trip. This is going to be essential for the Sacramento Kings for the remainder of this season. Bench output the Kings bench is one of the biggest strengths of this team. It's not just Malik Monk. It's a combination of players. Malik Monk, Chemezi Metu as of late, Trey Lyles, who hasn't played a lot, but played well early in the season. I don't know if he gets back into the rotation. Casey Paul has been playing really, really well defensively. Davion Mitchell, of course, as well. Like The Kings bench is essential for Sacramento's success. If the Kings bench is or continues to be solid, even if De'Aaron Fox is playing better, or Kevin Herter is making more shots, or DeMontis Sabonis uh, is staying out of foul trouble. If the Kings bench continues to play and have the impact that they've had consistently over the last, I'd say, almost a month, certainly since the first win streak, the seven-game win streak started, the Kings are at their best. The Kings are going to need their bench big time during this six-game road trip. Is there anything else you think that I missed out? Anything you think the Sacramento Kings need to do in order to have a successful road trip? And what's that successful road trip look like to you? Let me know at Matt George Sack on Twitter. Email me mattgeorgesports at gmail.com. Leave your thoughts in the YouTube comment section down below. This episode of the Locked on Kings podcast is also brought to you by Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for your sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. And for every single game this road trip, every single Kings day game for the remainder of this season, including hopefully play-in and playoffs, you can bet on every game on Bet Online. They'll have the best odds, the latest odds, the trends for every professional and amateur league out there from football to basketball, soccer with the World Cup going on right now, even esports. They've got it all on betonline.net. And if you love sports podcasts, you can find those on Bet Online as well. They're the fastest and easiest way to get your betting fix. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Use that Kings knowledge, use that NBA knowledge, use that sports knowledge, and maybe sometimes the Kings optimism or Kings pessimism to make yourself money on Bet Online, where the game starts. Before we wrap up, the Kings take on the Milwaukee Bucks tomorrow. Uh, the Kings struggle against the Milwaukee Bucks, to say, uh, say the least. I'm, I'm stealing this from a tweet that Deuce Mason from the Deuce and Mo podcast, Kings radio engineer. For uh, You can see him from time to time on Kings TV as well with Morgan Reagan. Uh, Deuce put out these numbers about the Kings and the Milwaukee Bucks that I think provide some really interesting context into this upcoming matchup because... Other than the Boston Celtics, I think the Milwaukee Bucks are the best team in basketball. I think they're a team that the Kings are going to struggle to match up against, and the Kings are going to need to play as close to a perfect game as they can to have a chance to beat, especially on the road. The Kings have not defeated the Milwaukee Bucks since February 1st, 2016. Now, it's not horribly long, like 2016 to, to 2022, okay, six years, it's been a while. That's not just beat. The, or that's not just beat the Milwaukee Bucks on the road. That's beat the Bucks. Period. The Kings have failed uh, to defeat the King or the Bucks for the last twelve games in Sacramento and in Milwaukee. The last time the Kings 
defeated the Bucks. Giannis Antetokounmpo was 21 years old. He was in his third season, and he had not made an all-star team yet. Yeah, that's what it took for the Kings to beat the Bucks. was Giannis not to be Giannis. And now that Giannis is Giannis, I don't know how in the world the Sacramento Kings are going to try and stop him. But unlike years past, I think the Kings do have a shot. I believe the Kings have a shot in every single game. And I'll say the same thing for this game that I said in the Celtics game, which the Kings failed at. I expect in the fourth quarter, late in this game, at some point, the Sacramento Kings will have a chance to win this game. They might not win it. The Bucs, who are a championship program with an MVP, a multi-time MVP, I expect them to know how to close the game at home better than the Kings do. But I expect the Kings to have a chance. They didn't. I mean, they did in the middle quarters, the second and third quarters in the loss in Boston, but in the fourth quarter, that game was was out of reach by the time the Celtics were done with their massive run. Can the Kings learn from that and be in the game and have a chance to steal one in Milwaukee? We'll have to wait and see. I'm excited for this six-game road trip. Again, I think uh, I, I think four and two should be the goal. I think three and three should be the expectation. Five and one, six and oh, that's just cherry on or the cherry on top of the sundae or the icing on top of the cake but maybe you feel differently maybe you have higher expectations maybe you have lower expectations the good news is the kings have a bit of a safety net to where if this road trip doesn't go well the kings in my mind absolutely should win two games if this road trip doesn't go necessarily well the way the kings are hoping they can handle it they can survive it's not going to put them in a deep dark hole but there are going to be trials there are going to be low points during this road trip. I expect that just based off of how difficult these road trips are. And uh, hopefully when the Kings come back and return to the Golden One Center on the 19th of December, uh, we're still t- celebrating a team that has a comfortable uh, gap or a comfortable safety net above 500. Appreciate your support as always of the Locked on Kings podcast. Following Kings and Bucks tomorrow, we'll have a Locked on Kings post game pod. So I hope you'll join me for that. Until then, my name is Matt George. You have been listening to Locked on Kings, part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Thank you.